I gotta remember to sit up straight. Hello, Haymarket. Hello, Haymarket. Yep. Do you know why we called it that? Haymarket? Market? <laughs> Are you guys? Uh, we we call it Hello Hay Market because we we're trying to model our business after Miggles. Okay. And he has the whole hyper geographic local thing. That's awesome. We want to buy into. So Perfect. This is like our journey. Hello Hay Market. Like here we come. Awesome. Ready? Yeah. Yep. Ready. Three, two, one. All right. Hi everybody. My name is Daniel Nice. I have a special guest, Mr. Ali Devar, here today on episode two, no three, episode three of the Hello Hay Market podcast. Ali, do you want to take a couple seconds just to introduce yourself to everybody? Definitely. So my name is Ali Devar. Um, I'm with the Casa Group, and Casa Group is a powerhouse real estate company. We also own construction and property management. Uh, we focus on hyper local geographical uh, real estate. We help buyers and sellers be smarter, make smarter decisions. Um, we're one of the top 100 teams within Kell Williams. Absolutely. And not only that, we've got five different office leaders on our team. And who's number one in volume right now, Mr. Ali? That's me. That's Thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's not going to brag about that himself, so I had to put it out there for him. Uh, Ali and I are good buds. Uh, how, we've known each other, what, two, three years now? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've just always been really impressed. My first impression honestly of Ali when when I first met you uh, it was actually not at this office it was like two offices ago yeah uh, when we were on the first floor of the building I came in and there was a um, trampoline trampoline <laughs> right like yeah. a Tony Robbins style like jumping for energy trampoline I'm and the that, trampoline guy yeah. that set the tone for me for the kind of guy you are uh, the kind of guy who's really interested in, like I like I could imagine walking in on you having like a self-help book out or a podcast in your ear or something <laughs> Yeah, we can definitely talk about the trampling and the effect it has probably later. Yeah, yeah, 100%. But so uh, today's main focus, what we want to talk about is we want to answer the question that I get asked all the time. And that question is, is now a good time to buy, right? We're seeing price drops all throughout the market. We're seeing all kinds of things shifting right mm -hmm. now. And so a lot of people are asking, like, is now a good time to buy? Should I rent? Um, and I'm going to have some different visuals I'm going to give you today, sure. just kind of get you your reaction off of. But just in general, is now a good time to buy? Sure. So, you know, that is uh, probably the most common question I get. And my answer is always the best time to buy is when you're ready, right? Mm -hmm. You can never time the market. Everybody's trying to time the market. So you'll realize that the market is shifting after it has already shifted. You're never going to be able to exactly, like as a seller, you want to make sure... Um, you're capitalizing on all the gains that you can get. You're you're selling at the highest point, but you won't know you're at the highest point till three months pass, and you're already going down the slide. Um, and now trying to like do price adjustments to really catch the market, it's like catching a falling knife, right? It's the same thing for the buyers. So you're either in a buyer's market or a seller's market. If you're ready to pull the trigger, uh, if you're ready to buy, timing is always good because the biggest indicator of building wealth is actually time. How much, like how long you've owned the property? What do I mean by that? I do have buyers out there. Um, I call them buyers. Like I have clients out there that are saying, "Hey, I'm going to wait for the market to crash." And they've been saying that since, for example, I know one in my head that's been saying that since 2017. They're waiting for the market to crash to go back to where they decided to wait. Probably even higher at this point, right? Same. Think about it. In 2019, COVID hit in 2020. Market started to kind of pick up, pick up, and um, uh, the the prices started to go up aggressively. And everybody's looking at that and has a fear of like maybe today is not the right time to buy. There was a lot of competition, and if somebody were to buy in into that into that market that seemed very scary, right now they would have a lot of equity that they've just built by letting the market kind of take the value where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. So as a buyer, you only lose money if you sell in a down market. Yes, you definitely want to buy when it's the you know best timing as far as like, I don't want to pay the highest price. Uh, but but if you really compare somebody who waited to time the market versus somebody who, who bought, who's wealthier, usually the person who's hold the property longer and build equity in it is actually wealthier. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? It makes a lot of sense to me. You know, I want to show you something that I saw where I was looking at the uh, share of U.S. household consumer expenditures by major categories, and this came out from the, the census that they did uh, back in 2020. Uh, Ali, I, I've already shown it, so I probably should have waited to present it to you, but did you sure. know in advance how what percentage of uh, the average U.S. household goes to housing? Yeah, so I can see over here. <laughs> it says 35%. Yeah. Um, and that's that's slightly higher than what it used to be. 
Um, the average uh, spending on a, on a housing overall was under 30s, and now it's it's over 30s. Yeah. Um, and that one reason is the price increase in the housing market. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also inflation in other areas, uh, yeah. but overall that has gone up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So when I'm having a discussion with a buyer, usually this is the elephant in the room. When they're trying mm-hmm. to get ahead financially, right, and they're talking about I'm going to save $2 by buying the less expensive coffee in the morning or by skipping the coffee. It's like you're, you're fiddling around on the edges. What you need to address is the number one expense that you have every day. And mm-hmm. that is what you're doing with your housing budget, mm-hmm. right? Is this something that's going into a piggy bank that's gonna appreciate in value, or mm-hmm. are you giving it to the landlord? If you're not controlling what you're doing with your housing uh, budget, mm-hmm. then how are you ever gonna be getting ahead, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. When that's your number one expense. Mm-hmm. Um, so the second question that I would actually wanna address with you is who has more net worth owners or renters have you seen any stats on that yeah i mean i don't remember off the top of my head but it's somewhere around like i think 40 percent like somebody who owns their own real estate uh, or their own uh, personal residence somewhere like 40 percent or some crazy number i'm not 40 percent 40 times wealthier than somebody who doesn't maybe you can pull the is it 40 wow yeah, i was so right on this, point so cnbc you didn't show me that one so i got that <laughs> yeah. one on my own no yeah this this is crazy when i saw the cnbc reported on a uh, survey of consumer finance that in 2019, the homeowners in the U.S. had a median net worth of $255,000, while renters had a net worth of just $6,300. That's a 40 times difference between the two groups in terms yeah. of their net worth. You know, recently I was on Instagram. I saw this guy who writes a lot of financial books, and he was kind of like arguing against this. So there's two ways of looking at this. That like a lot of people say owning your own home is a forced savings account, and that might not sound like a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. But I look at it as in like um, you can construct um, your your environment in a way that that encourages certain behaviors, right? Owning your own home. If you were to sell it, you still need somewhere else to live, right? So it's not like, oh, I'm cashing out. Maybe you're buying something else or maybe you go to rent and you're, you're actually cashing out. But owning a piece of real estate where you, um, you're you paying the interest to the bank, you're paying the taxes and, and insurance, but anything that you pay towards principal um, is actually going towards you. And the other reality of that is that, yes, it's true that the principal in the beginning is – uh, you, your payment is a lot more towards the interest than it is towards principal. But on a long, you know, on a long enough timeline, you end up wealthier than somebody who's renting. In most cases, in a case of a billionaire who's not like owning real estate, like that is such a small fracture of what they, you know, what their total net worth yeah. is that doesn't really make a difference, right? But in in you know, in usually in an average American household, um, owning your own real estate does make you a lot wealthier. Yeah, yeah. So you alluded to something earlier, uh, which actually is, was a great segue for what we want to talk about next, which is how does inflation impact the choice to buy versus rent? Like what comes to mind when you think of inflation for this yeah. discussion? Well, as inflation goes up, so, do, so does the price of uh, rent in a lot of cases. And that's also related, not directly, but it's related to price of housing and supply and demand there. Uh, but overall, as the price of homes, as inflation goes up, how it affects the price of home is through one labor, um, the cost of material that's used. And um, overall, if the market is inflating and there's less inventory that's available, it causes the price of housing to go up. Um, and that just makes it less affordable for buyers that are out there because inflation usually never goes up in relation to 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 income, right, to wages that are out there. Yeah. Um, now, having said that, again, I'm going to go back to – the best time to buy is when you're ready. Because if I were to look at this time right now, right, interest rates are below where they've historically been. So right now, interest rates, were, right now we're recording this in end of August of 2022, right? Yeah. And uh, interest rates have gone up, you know, a good percent or two since uh, a couple months ago, since three months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they fluctuated between six and five and six and five and six and five. And they're going to continue to fluctuate. And September Fed has another meeting. Most likely, they, they might raise the interest rates again. And perception is reality, right? The buyer out there might say, I heard this yesterday from somebody, say, I'm going to wait for it to go back to normal. And my thing is, this is not normal. Normal is the historic interest rates in the United States is 7.8 something. Mm-hmm. And the 20-year, the two-decade average is, is uh, high fives, right? I think it's 5.9 or 5.8 something. So right now... We're actually below where we've been historically, and we're right at where, where we've been in the, t- the last two decades, right? So where we are coming from was not normal, 
-hmm. Now you could wait for interest rates to go back down, but that's really trying to time the market. Yeah. What has caused, um, by interest rate going up, what has happened is actually kind of shrunk the demand side. So there's not that many you know, buyers out there as it used to be three months ago. Inventory has picked up. We're still in a seller's market. And all of a sudden, you have this perfect storm of interest rates are still below where they're likely going to be next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, right? Yeah. I can only go up from here. And it is not as competitive as it used to be at all. I can negotiate. I can actually ask the seller to pitch in towards my, my me buying my own interest rate to bring it lower because I'm the only buyer I can ask for that seller subsidy. So right now, I'm not saying everybody should just all of a sudden jump on this, but if you're ready, this is a great time. Yeah, yeah. I was actually looking at an article earlier today that was talking about how uh, three of the top reasons that people are currently giving for why the shifting market is an opportunity for buyers. Number one, they're pointing out that buyer demand had moderated, right? Where in April, people were getting five and a half offers on average on their houses. In May, it dropped to 4.2, and then in June, down to 3.4. So that's been trending down, giving people a better fighting chance at getting their house. Uh, second reason they provided was how uh, not as many homes are selling above asking price, where 61% were selling above asking in April, that dropped to 55 and then down to 51. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, the supply, right? You were talking about how this is still a seller's market. You, can you expand a little bit on what that means and sure. people who don't understand that terminology? Sure. So you're either um, in a seller's market, meaning there's more um, you know, buyers out there and there's less homes than the number of buyers out there. Therefore, sellers have more leverage, right? Mm -hmm. Think of supply and demand. There's there's one house and 10 buyers for that house. Or you're in a buyer's market when there is uh, a lot of houses on the market. We experienced this coming out of the 2008 recession where there's all of a sudden a whole lot of houses on the market, but then a, not a whole lot of people are buying real estate. So you have more um, homes than you have buyers. And in between, you have that balanced market that actually is like either, that is very rare, right? You're either going into a buyer's market or right. going into a seller's sort of market. Transitioning. Exactly. Yeah. So a seller's market is anything under six months of inventory usually. Like when you look at different sources, they say four to six months or five to seven months. But let's just say a balanced market is right around six months of inventory. Right. Anything lower than six months, meaning if I have six houses in this neighborhood and one sells every month, and right now there's six, and therefore there's six months of inventory because it takes a month to sell right. each one, right? Yeah. Um, and if I have more than six months of inventory, then I have, then I'm in a buyer's market. So right now we've gone from at least in where we are in Northern Virginia, where we're sitting in rest in, uh, in uh, you know, in this county, mm -hmm. we had less than two weeks of inventory. Yeah. <laughs> and we've gone from that to about one month of inventory. So again, perception is reality. It feels like, oh my God, the market is like crashing. But you only have one month of inventory where a balanced market is six months of inventory. Yeah. So you're still in a very strong seller's market. But it it's just, gotten easier. Ex yeah. It just doesn't feel like it right yeah. now. Like right? if you're comparing being a buyer today to being a buyer six months ago, being a buyer today is so much easier. It's so much easier. And the other side of it is like usually you don't end up in a seller's market where interest rates are still really low. So that's why I say it's that perfect storm. Interest rates are still really low. Now, you brought up another thing. You, you use the crash word. Right. And that's one of the last obstacles that I find a lot of people I'm, who I'm talking to are thinking about buying. They ask me, well, Dan, what if it crashes in the next couple of months? Right. What do you think, Ali? What's the likelihood? What do you look at when you're trying to decide for yourself? Hey, do I think it's going to be likely that it's going to crash? What kind of things do you pay attention to? Buying a home is an emotional decision. And you can't, you know, you know, when you buy a home, when you go in and see a home and emotionally falling in love with it, that's one thing. But you shouldn't allow the decision of whether I'm buying in general or not be as emotional as it could be, right? Because fear mm -hmm. is what causes us not to look at the facts and actually like process it very differently. So I've heard people say, this is going to crash since I got to, re got to real estate. I've, <laughs> yeah. I've actually, you know, like... Uh, <laughs> Every day, right? There's right. I haven't been in real estate since like, you know, the market cycles are usually like five to eight years. Right now, um, 2008 recession caused the cycles to be a little bit longer because that cycle took a little bit longer. So right now we're seeing about 10 year mm -hmm. for a cycle, right? Like where we go from a peak of a market down back up. Um, and everybody has a fear. Uh, it's the post dramatic stress after the 2008 recession that mm -hmm. this is going to crash again. A couple of things to note. Out of every four recessions in the United States, historically one affects the real estate market. 
Yeah. One was caused by the real estate market in 2008. So we all think as soon as there's a recession, housing market will crash. Well, in 2020, when the coronavirus started, we did have a recession. Real estate market carried the economy, right? Mm -hmm. So eventually there will be a crash. Eventually this market will go down. And that's just part of life. That's just, it's going to happen. That's the cycle. And it will go down, it will come back up. So if I was looking for myself, I would say I could either wait to time the market, and that's very unlikely, right? Mm -hmm. Will I be wealthier if I just buy now and know that the crash will come? And it doesn't mean I lost money. It means market went down, it will come back up. And if I absolutely have to move, can I keep this property as a rental? Move to another property, either either be, be qualified as a first-time home buyer again if I'm within a certain uh, distance from the same property and I qualify to buy that again with lower down payment if I need to, or maybe I don't even need to do that. Maybe take a cash out if out of this property if I have to. Might not need to do that, but maybe I'll keep this as rental, buy a second property, and when the market is good, I'll sell it. Or better yet, I don't sell it. I'll just keep it as a rental and I'll just become wealthier, right? But again, a lot of people are looking at, okay, maybe I don't want to do that and I do want to sell. You only sell when you sell, uh, when you, only, you only lose when you sell in a down market. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to sell in a down market. You can just keep it. That's right. That's right. All right, Ali. So uh, I think we're just about ready to wrap it up here. Is there anything that you want to give as your kind of elevator speech, how people can get in touch with you and how you could help them? Absolutely. Well, they can get in touch with us uh, at the Casa Group, the company we're part of. You can check us out, check us out online, um, and also on my social media, I'm on Instagram. Like you can find me there, Mr. Ali Davar. Right, mm -hmm. man, little plug there. <laughs> and uh, what we can help with, uh, I'm I'm always a resource, not just for uh, clients out there, but also for agents. I have a passion about helping agents. Uh, perform at a higher level. So anybody with any questions in regards to like com conversations like this or how to grow their business, I'd be happy to grab a cup of coffee or just uh, maybe just talk on the phone, right? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, Ali, thank you so much for coming in today. I really appreciate you and uh, I hope to have you appreciate on again you. in the future. Same here, man. Thank All you. Right. Quick, painless. Dude was ready. He was ready. I, I like not being uh, like, uh, what are we talking about? Just talk. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was realizing that as we were going. Yeah, I'm, like, I'm like, what is he looking at? Ooh, the ass is, uh, that is loud in my ears. That's crazy. So if you fart, I can probably hear it. In my yeah, that's, that's, uh, so don't fart during the podcast. I, I will do my, I'll do my darndest. Give me a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that should end up in the podcast. Well, so. <laughs> the bloomer. What's going to happen is that